In this video, we will explore the basics of an LZX post-production workflow. Or in other words, how to go from your analog video synthesizer to a digital video file ready for upload. While we will discuss different hardware options, this video is not an explicit step-by-step -step tutorial, but rather, we'll explore the vocabulary and terminology you need to know, and some of the different considerations to make when choosing how to capture your video files. This entire process can be broken up into five basic sections. There's the analog signal itself, then there's an analog to digital conversion, then there's the encoding process, the editing, and finally your output. The process of analog to digital conversion is very complex. While the analog signal is fairly simple, digital standards vary widely, and making sure that you're converting to the correct format for your eventual output is key. There are three primary solutions for digitizing your analog video. There are all-in-one devices which perform the analog to digital conversion and the encoding. These almost always have to be tethered to a computer to be used. The other option is to use a dedicated converter with a dedicated capture device. And a third option is to use a digital camera to film a screen presenting the video material. While it may sound lo-fi, this last option actually gives you a lot of creative potential, so you can experiment with different lenses, different shutter speeds, and different screens to get cool results. The digital camera capture method is pretty self-explanatory, so we won't go into it here. Whether you're using standalone devices or something attached to your computer, the first step in this process is going to be analog to digital conversion. As mentioned before, analog and digital signals are fundamentally very, very different. Analog signals are a continuous stream of information. However, signals embedded in the video tell the display when to jump to the top of a new frame. Analog video specifications are pretty limited. For the most part, you're going to be dealing with PAL or NTSC. For the sake of simplicity, this video is going to assume an NTSC signal. So your analog video output has 480 lines of information. This is called the resolution. And it displays at 29.97 frames per second. Digital video has a much wider variety of standards. First, let's look at resolution. Analog video displays at 480 lines of information. In digital terms, this is referred to as 480i or 480p. The other resolutions you are probably going to want to work in are 720p, 1080p, or 1080i. The i or p after the number refers to whether the signal is interlaced or progressive. The analog signal coming in from your video synthesizer is interlaced. Once you get into a digital format, you're going to most likely want a progressive output. Frame rate is the number of frames per second in the video file. Your LZX system, in NTSC, will have a frame rate of 29.97 frames per second. When capturing in digital, 29.97 frames per second is also a great choice. A lot of productions these days will use 23.98 or 24 frames per second. However, unless you need to integrate into other footage that was shot at that frame rate, our suggestion is that you stick with 29.97 all the way through your pipeline. Aspect ratio is the third and final consideration you have to make when converting your signal from analog to digital. Analog video really has no inherent explicit aspect ratio. However, it is almost always displayed with a 4 by 3 ratio. HD digital video, on the other hand, is almost always displayed with a 16-9 aspect ratio. You can choose to work in either a 4-3 or a 16-9 workflow, but it's important to make that decision and make the right choices along the way to fit it. No matter what you're using to capture and translate your footage, deinterlacing is going to come up at some point. Analog gear like the LZX synthesizer is interlaced. What this means is that every frame of video actually consists of two separate frames that are interleaved together. This was necessary for old cathode ray tube displays. However, with digital, this is no longer necessary and is actually kind of a nuisance. Some hardware devices will have deinterlacing controls built in. The decimator is one such device. Devices that do not have built-in hardware deinterlacing will need to be deinterlaced in software. And this is actually not a bad option. While hardware deinterlacers can give better results, software is going to give you a lot more flexibility. If the hardware deinterlacer is not high quality, you're capturing with that poor deinterlacing already embedded into the signal. 
Software deinterlacing has come a long way in the last few years. In some programs like Premiere Pro, the process is basically invisible. If you are capturing an interlaced signal into a progressive format and you are not explicitly deinterlacing it, you're going to get some nasty artifacts, and these cannot be removed further down the process. So always make sure to capture your interlaced signals in an interlaced format. Look for a lowercase i after the resolution, such as 1080i or 480i. Only capture in P formats if you have a dedicated hardware deinterlacer built into your AD converter. While deinterlacing can happen either in the hardware or the software side, scaling is almost always preferable to do in hardware. Your video synthesizer signal consists of 480 lines of information. Typically, you'll want to capture at 720 or 1080. The only reason you might want to capture at 480 is if your hardware does not support anything bigger or if you're very concerned about file sizes. As you start to process your digital video, whether it's just for simple editing, effects, or very elaborate post-production processes, you're going to lose a little bit of quality each step of the way. By converting the analog signal to bigger HD files, not only will it look better on newer TVs, but you'll also have more data to lose as you perform subsequent operations. Additionally, hardware upscaling tends to look higher quality than software. When it comes to aspect ratios, again, your analog signal is going to natively be four to three. Typically, you will have two options when capturing four three material into HD. One is pillar box. Pillarbox maintains the 4-3 aspect ratio of your video by burning black bars into the left and right of the signal. The other option is to zoom the 4-3 signal so it fits the 16-9 frame exactly. This is sometimes called de-squeeze, but sometimes it's called zoom. The name may change, but it's pretty easy to check on your device to see which terminology it uses. With aspect ratio considerations, this is mostly a question of taste. If your final video is to be presented on, say, YouTube at 4-3, Keep in mind that it will always have pillar boxes on the side. If you're going to go the 16-9 route and use a de-squeeze or zoom effect, keep in mind that certain geometric shapes, like circles, will appear distorted in the 16-9 image. This is why it's good to make sure you're monitoring in 16-9 while you're creating your compositions. On the hardware side of your analog to digital conversion, it's important to understand the different connectors and cable types that are involved in the process. LZX devices typically feature component or composite outputs. Component and composite signals can both travel on a variety of cables, most commonly BNC or RCA. The composite signal contains the entire video stream in one simple cable. Component breaks out the different color channels. This gives you higher fidelity. The component cable consists of a green, blue, and red channel. The green channel carries the sync information, and the other two carry the color. LZX hardware features RCA outputs. However, many of the AD converters you'll find on the market take BNC inputs. RCA and BNC signals are fundamentally the same, though. It's just the connector on the end. So all you need is a cheap converter to change one connector type to the other. Digital video files are usually transmitted via one of two formats, HDMI or SDI. SDI can be confusing because it uses the same BNC connectors that analog video signals do. However, these are not compatible. If you try to plug a component or composite output into a digital SDI input, you'll get no signal. So before purchasing a device, make sure it explicitly mentions that it can capture composite or component analog video. HDMI is a consumer standard that you're probably familiar with from all your home electronics. It is generally considered to be not as reliable as SDI and is rarely used in professional applications. However, for the purposes of capturing your analog video synthesizer, HDMI connections should be fine. Your biggest choice to make in an analog digital conversion piece of hardware is whether you want a standalone converter or something embedded into a bigger platform. Standalone converters are meant to work with separate dedicated recorders. Embedded converters are usually included in a studio device that will communicate directly with your computer. A nice standalone converter to start with is the Blackmagic Design Up-Down Cross. This will allow you to convert your component or composite signals from, say, your visual cortex into an HDMI or SDI HD signal that you can then send to a dedicated recording device. Another popular option is made by Decimator, but they feature built-in deinterlacing and a few other useful options. 
Blackmagic also makes higher-end Terranex devices, which are basically the industry standard for converting SD into HD signals. On the lower end, you can find a wide variety of devices for under $50 that will convert RCA composite signals into HDMI. While technically these devices will work, the quality can vary. In many cases, video synth signals are challenging for these kinds of devices. Remember, any information that is lost at this stage can never be regained. Once the analog signal is digitized, any loss in fidelity is permanently burned into the digital file. So a low quality conversion is really gonna hurt your final output. So to recap, in the analog to digital conversion segment of your workflow, your objectives are to take your analog video signal and convert it to a digital video signal at the correct frame rate, resolution, and aspect ratio. This signal can then be carried via HDMI, SDI, or directly into your computer. Once your video synthesizer signal has been converted to digital, then it's time to encode and record the signal. After making the conversion decisions, your digital signal is ready to encode into what is known as a codec. There are literally thousands of video codecs to choose from, so we'll keep this simple and only talk about a few. A codec basically defines how your video is compressed and decompressed. Some kind of compression is always necessary. Even if your encoding device offers it as an option, uncompressed video is never a good choice. The file sizes are massive and the benefits are almost none. What we suggest are what are known as lossless codecs. These codecs, such as Apple ProRes and Avid's DNxHD, reduce the file sizes significantly without losing any information. Encoding into MP4 is also not a good choice. You can find a lot of cheaper devices that will record MP4 files directly from your analog video signal, but you're going to lose a lot of information. MP4 video files use H.264 video compression. This video compression is great for typical video footage. And ultimately, this format is what you're going to end up outputting. However, without fine-tuning and kind of experimenting with the codec, H.264 does pretty gnarly things to video synthesizers. This can result in blockiness, loss of definition around edges, and a lack of color detail. When it comes time for your final output, you'll be able to fine tune your H.264 settings to get a good image. However, that is not possible during capture and not worth the risk. For those reasons, MP4 is never considered a good choice for encoding your raw videos. Most standalone recorders and pretty much all video editing software will support Apple's ProRes and Avid's DNxHD. Apple's ProRes is a good choice if you are on an Apple computer. On Windows machines, it can be a little bit less reliable. Avid's DNxHD works flawlessly on both platforms. It also gives you a few more encoding options than Apple's ProRes. Both codecs will work perfectly for any type of video synth workflow. Be aware, however, that there are many different flavors of ProRes and DNxHD. You can experiment with the different types and find one that has results that work for you. An important thing to always consider is the trade-off between file size and quality. For ProRes, I find that standard ProRes 422 works the best. Typically what you're looking for is a file size of about one gigabyte per minute of footage. Anything more than that, and you're likely not gonna see a huge benefit coming from an analog video signal like the LZX synthesizer. So when choosing hard drives for your video work, assume that you will need around 60 gigabytes for every hour of footage. This is also a good way to evaluate whether or not you're using an appropriate codec. If you capture an hour of footage and your footage is only 45 megabytes, there's probably something wrong. Similarly, if your hour of footage is up in the hundreds of gigabytes, you're probably doing something wrong. When it comes to encoding and recording your video, you have two basic choices. There are computer-based interfaces, and there are also standalone devices that record directly to hard drives. An important consideration to make is if your computer can handle it. If you do not have a fast PCI, USB 3, or Thunderbolt connection, chances are you probably won't get very good performance. You'll also need to make sure you have a super fast hard drive, whether you're using a standalone or a computer-based solution. Solid-state drives are cheap enough now that there should be really no other option. And within solid-state drives, there's a wide variety of speeds to choose from. If you're using a standalone device, the documentation will most likely list a number of supported drives that have been tested. We recommend definitely purchasing a drive from this list. If you have experience with other post-production workflows involving analog capture, a computer-based device might be the right choice for you. In addition to saving you a step in your workflow, these devices usually also offer sophisticated monitoring and encoding options. 
If you're new to the world of post-production, a standalone device is probably going to be your best bet. Standalone devices are great because for the most part, they're what you see is what you get. If there's a problem somewhere with how you're encoding or how you're converting your signal, your monitor will clearly display that something is amiss. One great advantage of standalone devices, with something like the LZX, is that you don't even have to turn your computer on to start capturing video. You can keep it set up next to your synthesizer and just push the record button whenever inspiration strikes. With the advent of DSLR cameras, a lot of hardware manufacturers started to come out with very robust standalone recording options. These include the Blackmagic Devices Video Assist, their older Shuttle, the Atomos Ninja, and other devices by Aja. If you are searching for an encoder and recording device specifically just for video synthesizers, we think it's hard to beat a dedicated converter next to one of these standalone recorders. And you can find an older Blackmagic HyperDeck Shuttle 2 for around 150 bucks on eBay. If you choose a computer-based device, like the Blackmagic Intensity Shuttle, you need to be prepared for a little bit of a more elaborate setup. Typically, you'll want these computer-based devices to integrate with your non-linear editing system. The Blackmagic devices have their own control panel, and this is where you'll set the all-important AD conversion and encoding choices. These need to match the capture settings on your editing software. While this is far too complex a topic to get into in this video, just be aware that computer-based devices will require a little more attention to detail. Once you've encoded your digital video into files, it's now time to start editing. If you're using a standalone device, you'll typically take the SSD from your device, load it into your computer, and copy the footage over onto your working hard drive. If you're using a computer-based encoding device, you most likely have already captured the footage directly into your editing program. No matter what editing software you use, it's important to make sure that your sequence settings match the precise specifications of the digital video file you captured earlier. Different programs will have different interfaces for this, but the fundamentals are the same. Make sure that the frame rate, resolution, and aspect ratio are all identical to those you set when you did your analog to digital conversion. Even if you eventually want to output into a totally different format, let's say 4K video, it is still beneficial to edit at the native resolution and frame rate of your captured footage. All editing programs will function better if you do this. One especially important thing to be aware of is that most video editing software these days ships with the defaults at 23.98 frames per second when you create a new sequence. While editing video of different frame rates won't necessarily look any worse in your timeline, it will slow down your editing process, and you might find that your timeline lags or jumps or pauses. So always check, and then double check, that your sequence settings match the specifications of your original footage. Once you have finished editing your video, it is now time to output to your desired final format. Most likely, you're also going to want to make an MP4 file for uploading to YouTube or other services. Again, MP4 uses H.264 compression, which can be really hard on video synth type footage. In your output encoding settings, always make sure you set it to two-pass encoding. You can experiment with different bit rates, but at some point you'll hit a wall of diminishing returns. We usually recommend somewhere between 16 and 20 kilobits per second. This process can sometimes require a little bit of trial and error. If you have a very long video, it's a good idea to export just one or two minutes of it at a time with different settings until you find something that you like. So that's a basic post-production workflow for your LZX video synthesizer. Please let us know if you have any questions in the comments, and also let us know if there are parts of this process that you would like us to go into more detail with. This is a very broad overview, but hopefully this gives you enough to make some informed purchasing decisions on your hardware and to get going with your own post-production workflow.